when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. If a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, the distance from the Praetorium to Calvary had to be the longest 650 yards in the universe. As Pontius Pilate sat in his quarters mulling over what more he might have done to save Jesus, a demonic feeding frenzy was breaking out on the streets of Jerusalem. The battered and bleeding Jesus is kicked and slapped and shoved by Roman soldiers and Jewish temple authorities all the way from the courtyard to the street where a new torment awaits him. Soldiers tie a 110 pound crossbeam called the patibulum across Jesus' shredded back, and the grisly mark to the place of execution begins. Satan has moved many of the people lining the streets to watch this macabre parade to kick, strike, and spit on Jesus. The soldiers who had mockingly hailed Jesus are enjoying the spectacle. However, the officiating centurion grows impatient as the prisoner, undoubtedly suffering from shock, continues to stumble and fall under the weight of the instrument of his execution. You carry it for him, the offers. officer bellows to one of the onlookers, a Cyrenian named Simon. Finally, after what must have seemed like an eternity, the gory procession arrives at the hill. The Hebrews call Golgotha, what we call in English, the place of a skull. The patibulum is placed on the ground and Jesus is thrown backward upon it. One group of soldiers pins Jesus' arms while another soldier feels for the depression at the front of his wrist, locating the perfect spot. The soldier then drives a square nine-inch wrought iron spike through it. Quickly, the soldier moves to Jesus' other wrist and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flexibility of movement. The small detachment of soldiers then lift Jesus, suspended by the spikes in his wrists, to the top of the upright post already fixed in the ground. A wooden sign that was paraded in front of the Lord is nailed to the top of the completed cross. This sign called the titulus bore the list of crimes for which the prisoner is condemned. Today, this titulus bears the unusual inscription, Hutas Esten Iesu Habasileos Ton Judeon. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Another soldier grabs Jesus' dangling feet and shoves them backwards into each other against the cross. Another iron spike is driven through both arches, leaving the knees slightly bent. Jesus is now crucified, riveted to the cross. As the Lord slumps downward, the spikes press against the median nerves in his wrists. The resultant pain that explodes through his fingers and arms and into his brain is so shockingly intense that a whole new term is invented in an attempt to describe it. Excruciating. Stunned by the pain and unable to exile, exhale in this hanging position, Jesus presses the weight of his body against the spike through his torn feet in an effort to relieve the anguish. His efforts are rewarded by even more searing agony as the spike tears through the nerves between the metatarsal bones at his feet. 
as Jesus first struggles upwards and sags downward in this gruesome ballet of death. The muscles in his arms begin to give out as great waves of cramps paralyze his body. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Even though he could now call down twelve legions of angels from heaven, Jesus threatens no one. In death as in life, Jesus Christ is only concerned with those around him. With each agonizing, spasmodic lurch upward to gasp a mouthful of life-giving oxygen, Jesus prays. He prays first for the soldiers, now parting his garments. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then he proclaims the good news to the penitent malefactor. Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus next ensures that his mother will be well taken care of. As he turns first to Mary and says, Woman, behold thy son. Then turning to his beloved disciple John, standing next to Mary at the foot of the cross, Jesus says, Behold thy mother. Even the indescribably horrible pain of crucifixion cannot compare to the agony that Jesus must now endure as his soul suffers the very torments of hell itself. Pain intended for Satan, for you, and for everyone else who has ever fallen short of the glory of God in this blackest moment of human history. Jesus calls out in the Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is to say, being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A crushing chest pain racks his innermost being as body tissue fluid fills the sack around his heart, crushing it. The Lord Jesus Christ is literally dying of a broken heart. Darkness descends upon the land. The sky is as dark as it would be at midnight of the new moon, except the time is three in the afternoon. Well, knowing the mission for which he is sent is complete, Jesus speaks in a low fading voice, I thirst. The inhuman physical punishment of the past 18 hours has taken its toll. For Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, death draws near. Death draws near to the Lord, but it is the Lord of life who carries the day. And then to confirm his complete and total victory over sin, death and the power of the devil on behalf of all mankind, Jesus musters his last ounce of strength straightens his body upwards and proclaims tetelestai it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost just to make sure the centurion orders a soldier to plunge his lance into Jesus lifeless body the weapon passes through the Lord's rib puncturing the fluid-filled sack around his heart. And forthwith there come out blood and water. The earth quakes, lightning strikes, and deafening thunder punctuates all that has just transpired. 
And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, whose pleas on Jesus' behalf had fallen on deaf ears, approaches Pontius Pilate with an unusual request. Governor, I ask that you give me the body of Jesus of Nazareth so that he can be buried. Pilate can't believe what he is hearing. Jesus can't be dead already. It's been less than 12 hours. Why, a crucifixion death should last at least two days. Centurion, Pilate barks. Is the Nazarene really dead? A centurion just back from Golgotha, invisibly shaken, answers in the affirmative. Yes, Joseph, you may have the body. Centurion, have a detachment take the condemned down from the cross and deliver him to this man, Joseph. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is dead. The man in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily is dead. The Lord of life is dead. God is dead. The spikes are pulled from his motionless wrists and feet, and his cooling body is wrapped in a burial cloth. His corpse is taken to Joseph's own brand new tomb and laid on a cold stone slab. The great disc-shaped stone designed to keep out grave robbers is rolled across the entrance. And with one final heave, the tomb is sealed. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Amen. And the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall guard and keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. I continue singing hymn 153.